Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the webinar. I can see you all flowing in for the session. I'm just going to quickly share my screen, make sure you can see that okay. Uh, you are all here for uh, a combined webinar with uh, Approval Max, Anature, and Expert. Topic being the biggest scams affecting Australian businesses in 2023. Now, we've only just started the webinar. So whilst we've started it and you're all coming through into the session, uh, I'll introduce myself. We'll talk a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm going to introduce you to our amazing panel that are, uh, I've been speaking to them all week about this and I'm, I'm very excited. You've got some knowledgeable people sharing good nuggets of uh, wisdom uh, with you today. Um, first things first, my name is Trent McLaren. Uh, I am the host for the session today uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, being your host and helping you get the most out of this 60 minute session. So uh, to start with housekeeping, we'll always go with uh, making sure you can hear and see us okay. So we both have a chat and a Q and A's function here. If you can just type into the chat or the Q and A and just say, hey Trent, I can see you. Uh, I can see Brendan's got a nice background. The screen is being shared properly. That just allows us to uh, make sure that it's all working well. Feel free to tell us where you're dialing in from too. So if you're anywhere sunny or cold or you've got a coffee or a winery nearby, tell me about it. I need to know good places to uh, visit. It's a good way to see where we're all coming in from. Yarrawonga, I've been there once. There we go. It's already started. Oh, hello, Katrina. Big surf coast. <laughs> My favourite part, seeing all the people coming through. Bunbury WA, amazing. Okay, good. Well, the chat is working. Now, importantly, you can ask questions and chat all the way through. This is an interactive session. So the more you put in there, the more that you will get out of it. If you've got questions, you've got things you want to ask, you want tips, advice, lay it on us. Uh, you want the meaning of life? We're not covering that in this session, but next time we may. Uh, today on this session, I've got uh, three awesome people that I mentioned before. So I'm going to start with Brendan Lucas. Brendan is the Head of Accounting at Approval Max. How are you, Brendan? I'm really good. Treat yourself. Very well, thank you. Tell us a little bit about what you do at Approval Max. Right. So my role as, a, as, a, as an owner of an accounting firm is to basically support the Approval Max team with what they're rolling out to businesses and non-for-profits and accountants to make sure that their product is sort of fit for purpose and, and you know, and solves those pain points um, in regards to approvals for invoicing and bills. Awesome, very good. And as you mentioned, you're also managing director slash lead janitor for your accounting firm. Uh, Next Dimension Accounting, right? That's correct. Don't do as much janitor work as I probably should. Yeah, nice. You're probably smart. You outsource it, right? <laughs> yeah. And just before I move on, how many people in your uh, team? We've got 18 people at Next Dimension. Wow. Okay. Nice one. Uh, next on my list, we have Emrita Abbott, CEO and founder of Anacha. Emrita, how are you? I'm very good. Um, thank you all for attending. It's been a while since I've been on a webinar, but um, my background, um, possibly you may remember me from Now Infinity. Um, on an exit in 2020, established Anature, which is a leading e-signing and ID verification business. My goal is to find all the pain points within the accounting um, and financial service industry and solve them with technology. So thanks for having me. Love that. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Soraya Brown. Soraya is Head of Client Success at Expert. Soraya, how are you? Good, thanks. Nice to be here. Um, I guess my role at Expert is to um, ensure all of our clients are set up. Um, Expert, if you haven't heard of it, is an AI automation tool that assesses um, all your financial data and looks into potential fraud or errors within the files. Very cool. And how long has Expert been operating for? Around four to five years now. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. And you guys have a team uh, up in Coffs Harbour as well as your uh, team based in Sydney. Yeah. Very sure cool. Sure do. They get to, you know, sit by the beach and <laughs> have a drink every now and then rather than being in the city. Yeah. Very nice. Wouldn't that be uh, the luxury that we'd all love? 
Uh, awesome. Well, thank you for being here and thanks for uh, getting stuck in. So um, a few things and oh, should have did this before as I was introducing everyone. But if you are on LinkedIn, you're on social media, you want to connect with any of our panelists, you can find all of them uh, on LinkedIn. You can just search their name. Uh, feel free to tell your friends that you're on the session hanging out with us today. Uh, you can take that conversation online. What we want to start with today was some data points that we uncovered. Uh, actually, earlier this month, ACCC came out with a new report that talked through scams, uh, fraud and impact that, have, uh, that is hitting or has hit Australian uh, small businesses and, and consumers as well. Um, some staggering numbers in here. Uh, so don't be, uh, don't be upset, don't be scared. Uh, these are things that just unfortunately happen every single day, but um, the more we talk about it, the awareness that we can bring to these situations, the better we can be uh, informed. At the end of the day, you're here because you're interested. You want to know what are these things and how do I make sure I protect either myself or my clients? Uh, we know that there's a mixture of either accounting, bookkeeping and small business owners on this call today, on this session today. Uh, and again, there's something, something for everyone. So we came across this report only a few weeks ago. You can see 17th of April was the date that we uh, highlighted. And what? And you can read the whole thing. I just skimmed and pulled out the best parts for you for our panellists to digest today. Um, but we looked at what the top scams were by loss as reported by Scamwatch. And you can look up Scamwatch. They, they track and monitor all this data so that we can understand the trends, the patterns, how is this evolving uh, and how do we stay across what's, uh, what's going on? So coming in at number one was investment scams, $377 million. Um, I think, you know, we hear that person in the pub saying, oh, I've heard this really cool thing. They just wanted me to put 20K in. It was no big deal. Sounds too good to be true. Could have been a crypto thing. We heard crypto people that were getting defrauded um, out of uh, fake crypto setups that were happening. Uh, whole kinds of things. Uh, dating and romance scams. I uh, got a dodgy text message yesterday from someone that left their uh, ID on. It said Ed in the thing, but it signed off with Rosemary in the text. So I was a bit confused as to who I was speaking with, if it was Ed or if it was Rosemary. But I think the things we've highlighted and read are the things that we know impact our B2B um, organisations. And they're the ones I want to start with today. So um, Brendan, my first question I'm going to throw to you to start with. When you see these items in red, what are the common scenarios that you're uh, coming across or experienced in your day-to-day -day life, whether that's on the approval max front or um, in your accounting firm? Yeah, look, thanks, Trent. Um, a couple of ones that come to mind. One is um, invoices being sent for payment and then actually being intercepted along the way and bank details being changed. So by the time it actually gets to the business to make the payment, if they refer to those bank details, they're incorrect. They've gone back to the scammer. Um, another one is then that sort of um, that email conversation basically saying, hey, can you do something urgently for me? Um, and then it's actually coming from the client, from the, the other person's email address, whether that's internal or um, some other sort of key stakeholder. So I've seen a couple come into our business before where we had a client actually telling us to change their bank details for payroll. But, um, and the conversation started, but then we soon worked out it wasn't them because why wouldn't they do it themselves? So they picked the wrong person to, to, to do the emails from. But things like that where basically it looks like it's coming from the right person, but they've intercepted in between. Um, and that's where using email for some of these things is really dangerous because it, it's, it's a lot easier to hack through email than it is other external systems. Yeah, that is interesting because if they send that email to everyone, right, and it's just that you're the only person that's picked it up or you're like, no, no, I didn't send this, uh, that, that's uh, a pretty crazy environment. And it happens to everyone, right? Like I've, we've seen it all the time in my books and everything else. Um, Soraya, I was going to ask your side. You guys see a lot of this stuff. Um, how, how do you think about that from Brendan's scenario? Definitely, I think like with um, expert, we're going to raise it when we do see those changes actually occur within the accounting file. So we can bring it up and identify, you know, if there have been contact bank accounts changed or even internally within the practice um, or the, the business itself that someone's gone in and, and done it themselves as well. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Um, one of the other ones here we're looking at is identity theft. And, and I know you, you're quite passionate about this, which yeah. is why you built a product and invested lots of money into it. But 
Um, how, how do you guys think about this identity theft piece? Yeah, look, I think just to um, address even the emails, um, obviously being an e-signing um, company, the first question, and, you know, I've been, you know, in the industry of e-signing since 2012. Um, but the major thing is, you know, who do we know that, who do we know um, and do we know the right person is signing at the right time? Um, so some of the things that, you know, we've actually adopted, and this does um, rely, you know, and does extend to identification, is obviously through the email and the SMSF notifications. And we track these through every step of the process from when they're delivered, when they're open, when the links are clicked. Um, by doing this, we can actually verify the intended recipient, making sure that we're reaching the right person. We also use properties, you know, metadata properties, such as the IP address, the user agent, the geographic location, um, to ensure that it actually is going to the right person. And also, in, you know, in addition to that, in tracking the emails and the SMSF notifications using these sort of metadata properties, you know, we obviously offer two-factor um, through this email opening, but also we can include a unique verification client reference number, which could be a six-digit code. So um, we're well and truly aware um, of these emails being opened by the wrong recipient or actually tampered with, and this is how we overcome it. Um, so again, the identification process is a little bit different. That's where we use biometrics, but this one just to actually stop the um, fraudulent behaviour of the email in the first instance. So a lot of people don't trust technology, right, which is why they use emails in the first place or why they've set it up in a particular way. Um, yep. How do we, how can we educate our audience today? How can I say that the technology is safer than um, not doing it? Straight post. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, look, I'll jump in here um, only because, like I said, I've been banging on about, uh, you know, for such a long time. Um, there is a big educational curve, but I think that we are sort of moving out of that early adopter stage. Obviously, you know, overseas, um, they've had this um, security measures put in place a lot earlier than what we have. But again, using the likes of AWS, um, you know, we, we do collect some sensitive data, which could be TFN bank details if the recipient does want that. And to achieve the most secure way with encrypted value, you know, we use uh, we don't use plain text. Um, it's only accessed by the personnel and using something like Amazon's key management services um, with encryption encryption technology. So again, it's just education um, for the end consumer um, and hopefully taking them on the journey that this is a much safer way than you know still through the postage. And please, you know, we we really ensure that do not send this data via email because this opens you up to you know obviously hacking and obviously people into, um, interpreting that data and using it for themselves. So definitely um, decryption keys and the likes of is is, is priority for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, Brendan, what about you? What's your feedback? You deal with clients all the time, small business owners. How do you give them confidence that the tech is going to be more secure than uh, than doing it manually? Yeah, look, well, and again, I hate bringing up the word again, but COVID just fast tracked everything, right? That it, it made it a, a necessity rather than an option. Um, you know, m most organisations have a portion of their workforce working from home, so you know, when I think about approval max and bills, it's much harder to pass that piece of paper around now with the approved stamp and get the signatures when everyone's working from home and they live in different states or different parts of the city. So um, I think with the likes of two-factor authentication, I think that's added a lot of extra um, comfort to clients. Um, and look, the the software out there now, the mainstream, you know, they've had to go through so many security protocols to even link up to the likes of a zero or QuickBooks. I think that is putting a lot of people at ease. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm finding nowadays that's less of an issue than the clients when we had these conversations sort of three or four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, Soraya, so I know, I know your backstory, I know the company's backstory, but why don't you just tell us a little bit, like, why do you guys exist in the first place? Yeah. So both our founders, um, had errors within their files and, and some fraud happening, um, within their businesses. At the time, there was nothing that kind of alerted them to it. Um, obviously, there's, you know, human error in that sometimes you can't see everything. Um, so they went out and decided to build um, the AI technology to go over the files and find any risk that might be happening. So this could be like, you know, duplicate bills. So you want to make sure that that's all correct. Contact bank accounts are the same. Employee details have been edited. So you don't want to like have anybody siphoning funds, we're going to pick all of that up for you. Um, so yeah, they saw that gap in the market and now we can identify all our users um, and clients in there as well. 
Yeah, awesome. How, how many files are you guys scanning at any one time in the day at the moment? Thousands, thousands. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Because um, one of the points here was talking about is false billing, right? And I know that's something you guys tackle. And then Brendan, from your view, I'm actually keen to understand, like, you've got clients that obviously use approval max and those that don't, but what, what's the difference? Like, how do you articulate to someone, this is why we create this process in the first place? Well, I think the, the big thing for you know, using approval max, it, it's, it's allowing to segregate um, duties and, and empower your managers to actually control their budget and their lines. So what used to happen often is a bill would come in and go to a council to get paid or maybe get signed off by someone, um, the CEO, but that'd be it. And so everyone in between the organisation who actually organised that, organised that um, cost or purchase, whatever that was, isn't involved in that approval and payment process. Um, so by using approval max, you can actually set up rules um, to give a, a power to those individual managers for their line items to approve certain bills or to reject them. Um, where I see it really helpful, um, it's, it can be partly fraud but partly error, is where you've got organisations with multi entities and the bills get sent to the wrong entity or they get invoiced from the they get invoiced um, incorrectly. It's a chance then to stop it. Um, at that point, they go, hang on, I didn't approve that cost. I'm going to reject that payment. Um, where, you know, without something like approval, Max, it's a lot harder to pick those things up. Yeah, because it's a stopgap, right? It's like it's forcing you to kind of make sure that the right person signing it off, there's a clear procedure to follow. So without one, if you, and I mean, at the moment, the procedure is send an email, an email to someone else, or it's a Slack message. I don't know if anyone saw, was it the BTX, the, uh, the, they were using Slack for approvals with emojis on thousands upon thousands of dollars. And that was just a, I mean, I think it is stupidism more than fraud, I think, but um, I don't think it's made up a word, uh, but yeah. When we think, um, and you touched on this before with the e-signatures piece, but when, when you're dealing with any organization, because you sit on the board of a few different things, what, what's, their, what's the best approach you've seen at the moment for firms trying to stay secure? There's going to be a particular mindset or something that they're keeping in the back of their head to, to be aware of all these things? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, and the Scam Watch um, obviously has a page on this too. There's there's only a couple of valid points really. And I think, you know, I would, I'm, I'm sort of talking to everyone that's probably, you know, being preached about this, but, you know, obviously using strong, unique passwords um, is essential. Um, you know, using the two-factor, making sure you don't, you know, ch uh, ch share the password with anyone. And, you know, just be cautious of when you're clicking down links and so forth. So, I mean... We can only go as far as what the consumer is willing to put into place. Um, technology is moving very fast. And, you know, we're, we're ISO, ISO certified. That was the first step for, you know, amateur um, and the likes of. But it really is up to the end consumer to embrace um, these steps. But, again, it's, it's just a simple thing. Unique passwords, two-factor, making sure if you want a pin code on top of that as well. So, um I think everyone's very familiar with that outside of that, besides handing your phone over and your emails over to someone. Um, you know, <laughs> that's the best you can probably do at this point. One thing I did want to touch, yeah, one thing I did want to touch on, and I think this is um resonates with Brendan as well, is you know, in the now infinity days where we were looking after 600,000 companies with um ASIC. Uh, we ran a discrepancy report, and this is not only just for now infinity, but it was running across zero, it was running across accounting practices um uh, software. Um, notifying and identifying the change in people's uh, names and so forth. We were looking for Phoenix Singh at that time. And, you know, I happened to have four names, um, you know, included two middle names and a surname. And I had around about five or six different companies and not one of them matched. So it could be Amrita Maureen Shelton, it could be Amrita Abbott, it could be this, this and this. And then, you know, if I went and compared that into zero and HQ and to you know, XPM, it was very, very different. So we can see now that technology is actually helping um, people find and identifying um, but then the owner's still actually trying to get the right data and putting it back in. So I can see where, you know, XP and obviously the other likes of, um, you know, are really doing a great job to try and limit that. And um, I think that's really important as well, getting that right information into the right systems. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but the amount of data hygiene uh, issues <laughs> that I think most, uh, most businesses and accounting firms have um for another webinar uh top contact methods was fairly interesting and i think we all experience like i get toll I, don't know, I mean it could be a toll but i actually think it's a scam all the time right um overdue toll text messages uh 
I always get really hesitant to click on any link in a text message, to be honest. And the more yeah. I get them for, with unique codes and passwords, sometimes it's really annoying and freaks me out, especially if I'm not expecting it. Like, how did you get my phone number? Um, phone calls. So, uh, again, I get random phone calls where it's a normal mobile number, but you answer it and there's nothing there. I heard stories about people recording you saying hello, your name, all these things, all these different things, and being able to like create um, uh, like a voice robot of sorts to communicate with the provider, say hi, it's Trina, and whatever. So I'm always really nervous, nervous to speak when I get one of those dodgy calls. Yeah, I, I'm I'm one of the people that are actually impacted by um, the tolls. I think I get a text message every second day to pay a toll. You know, I live on the Gold Coast. Um, I seldom go to Brisbane Airport. You know, I fly out of the Gold Coast. And guaranteed every second day, it's from a different URL um, to pay the bill. So, and I think this is one of the big ones that you can see on ScamWatch um, that is, is actually popping up is this toll. Um, I think it's linked, right? Something like this. Yeah. Um, and I can't stop it. I report it. I, you know, just it's there. And so I think the next question is like, why is Telstra allowing it? Um, if we want to look at some of our big, big boys, um, how can they actually allow this to, and it, because it can be very easily done to actually hijack a number. Uh, I think that's a big, big, big problem. Yeah, that is a good point. I actually have a question about, you know, governing bodies and people in, like, you know, what, what should they be doing to help us out? We'll come to that. On this top contact methods piece, I think for the audience that are watching, check out the amount reported as lost. Main reason being, um, you can see where a lot of this money goes. It is phone calls, right? Like 141 million lost last year. This apparently was 80% up on the year before. So they've lost more in the last 12 months and they did prior. So yep. our criminal cybercrime, it's only getting smarter. They're only getting more aware of different ways and they literally spend all day doing this. That's all they're trying to do is how can I get a few hundred bucks from each person that I'm trying yep. to uh, hack? But being aware of these reported um, losses is, is really key. And then age and demographics. Now I came into this and I don't mean to say this, but you just, my grandpa, my grandma, like they're older people, phone rings they're like oh it's you know that lovely chat down the road really want you know really nice and uh what i was surprised about is just the fact that it impacts everyone um doesn't matter if you're as old as my grandparents are or if you're uh young everyone is experiencing a significant amount of loss so uh it can it can happen to each and uh any of us there we go broken down one more time cool i think uh, and these are the three things that the scam watch were recommending yeah. or do. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing the screen in a second. We're going to go straight into just questions with the rest of our panel. But they said, stop, don't give money or personal information to anyone if you're unsure. I think a lot of providers actually say to you, we will never ask you for X, Y, and Z. Um, so just be really conscious. You, you, this may just seem like common sense, but... For any, it may not. So let's just pretend we're all learning for the first time. Um, think and just ask yourself, could this be fake? Is it real? Why would they be calling me about this? Is that normal? Um, and then act quickly. I think most banks, you can obviously freeze cards, freeze accounts. They've got dedicated hotlines for this stuff. So if you are ever feeling like you've been defrauded or something's wrong, call your supplier straight away and let them know that, hey, this doesn't feel right. Can you just... Help me out for a sec. Yeah. Cool. And Trent, I, I think what's really important there is for the especially people on the webinar, you obviously put fraud and this sort of risk front of mind, um, but you're probably someone at a high level of management or it's your business or accounting firm, so it's your money. But more than likely, the person who will be scammed won't be you. It will be your team. And it won't be through, it hopefully won't be deliberate. It will more be because they were under pressure, they weren't thinking, they were having a bad day, all those sort of reasons, and they could click a link or make a change because someone sent them an email instruction um, but didn't actually follow those couple of steps. So I think, to me, that sort of regular internal training is critical um, to protect your business um, because it's not about you, it's actually about the whole team because they can get one entry point is all they need. Yeah, I yeah agree. so after we had this session last week, I actually uh, did a session with my team because I freaked out. I was like, oh, no, I've thought about this all wrong. It's uh, Tom, one of my uh, EA admin, like 
in all of my inboxes. I'm like, oh no, what if he clicks on something and I've not looked at or seen it? So yeah, I agree with that point. Train and teach everyone on how to do this. Um, Soraya, from your view, you work with a lot of firms that are getting set up for the first time. You must hear some war stories or horror stories. Um, I'd love for you to just share one with us, something that you've heard or seen uh, or you've helped them uncover during that onboarding process. Yeah, I guess like when you first load up a file to expert, we do look back at like two financial years worth of data and what's kind of going on across there. Um, you know, recently I've seen there's a lot of people doing businesses like uh, doing you know payments with ABNs that are incorrect on all the bills. So you're kind of not allocating all of that correctly. Um, a lot of, um, you know, contact bank accounts that are your employees are the same as, you know, suppliers and all of that. So that's been picked up as well. Um, but I guess just to the same point as um, Brendan before, the alerts kind of start to teach the team members as well about what those risks are as they're being alerted. So um, definitely important to have a look at that and see, you know, what the issues are that can arise, even if it might be, you know, something minor like adding in ABN details, it'll still educate the team on what's really going on within the file or what could potentially happen down the track. Great. Uh, there was a, uh, I, I love that. And it's good to just help people be aware. And I, I always love hearing stories about what they discover through that process. Um, Brendan, you, you, I know you've been a user of that product as well, but have you, what's the biggest thing that you've uncovered or it's uncovered for you when you've scanned all your files? Yeah, look, one, it didn't end up being a scam, but it was quite interesting is um, it popped up and said this bank account details for Joe Smith was the same as, as Sally Jones, who's your employee. So I rang the um, owner and said, hey, um, did, what's going on here? Did, did you know it's the same bank details? He goes, oh, that's a bit of a worry. Um, I'll get back to you on that one. Makes a couple of inquiries. You go, oh, oh, no, they're actually together. Um, so they're spouses and they've just used their bank details for the refund. Because oh, we're okay. He said, but geez, that's good that you found that. Um, so... And to me, that's where it comes down to who has access in your accounting system to change bank details to reduce that risk because you, know, you want expert to pick it up and you want approval max to do the process. But once the money's gone, it is um, harder to get it back. So obviously controlling that at the outset, I, I think is critical. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I agree. There's a few good questions coming in. And there was one I actually wanted to highlight because I experienced this in a prior company as well. Um, but the question that came up was if you're scammed with a credit card payment, doesn't the bank just refund you anyway? Now, before Face ID and Biometrics came in, yes, most of the time the bank would just refund you and say, look, not your fault, you're not liable, someone's stolen your card. But what I've seen um, recently in my time with another financial services provider was when a phone was hacked. So someone's downloaded a password manager or something like that on the app store. And that's actually given someone over in, uh, I think this in this case, it was Russia, access to the mobile device to the point where they could send themselves the SMS, change the biometrics to be themselves. So now they're going out and they're making payments using someone else's device because they've cloned the device, using their face as the face ID, the biometric. When the customer has then tried to get a refund saying, hey, this is a chargeback. This is like someone's stolen my details. The bank wouldn't refund it because from their point of view, the biometrics were checked. Everything was done according to what was set in place. The fault and the liability sat with the person that installed the password manager on their phone, that was their fault, not necessarily the bank's fault. So it was an interesting, um, uh, yeah, it was an interesting sort of insight because my expectation was that if you've had a fraudulent payment, I've had a fraudulent payment on Amex before, um, I got it back pretty much straight away. Uh, but in this case, there was thousands of dollars that this business was not going to get back because of the way that the identity, the identity and then payments were stolen uh, in there. There's a yeah, few questions. Sorry. I think mm. that's um, an important thing too. I've actually experienced the same thing. This it was around about this time last year. Um, I, I obviously don't check my bank statements, but my son was, you know, grateful enough to go through it and said, oh, you know, what, what's Thirsty Camel? Um, I said, I have no idea. And he said, oh, it looks like you spent <laughs> quite a couple of thousand dollars at Thirsty Camel. Um, unbeknown to me, that actually is a bottle shop um, in service. Now, um, it was about $6,000 spent um using a 
card that I actually still had in my wallet. So um, again, the same thing, somehow they got it onto their phone, they were tapping it, um, and the banks did actually reimburse it because it was um, multiple locations and different flights and things like this. So there, there was an exorbitant amount of expenditure, but I had my card, I hadn't changed my phone, I got my phone, all the security was there, but somehow um, through the tapping service, I was actually then, you know, skimmed or whatever, and they were actually going out and using it. Um, I did not experience the fact that the banks did not um, reimburse, but um, it's still unbeknown to me how they could do that without actually having access to my card. That's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, someone just asked about what happens when a deposit goes into a fraudulent account. And my answer is probably the same. It depends on circumstance. Like I'm, I don't work for the bank. Uh, I'm not necessarily an expert in that piece. But um, this is where having good AP scanning or AP processes is key, right? Like um, Brendan, you probably speak to that more than most or even Soraya from your side too. Like you're scanning all the data. Brendan, you've got the stop gap in place to make sure that everything's uh, checked accordingly. Um, but circumstances will always determine and depend on, and it changes all the time because that biometrics thing I mentioned before wasn't a problem 10 years ago. That's only a five year piece of technology being able to do touch ID, face ID and all that. So it's important that we stay across and aware of all those things. Yeah, Trent, with, with that payment, I think the key thing is when you're making payments to to new suppliers is what's your verification process to be comfortable those bank details are correct. Because if you are receiving them via email, we know from what Emirates said, that's not the most secure platform, um, but we all rely heavily on it. Um, so to me, um, a lot a, what we encourage our clients to do is to verbally get someone to verbally confirm and to ring a public number from Google or something like that. Don't use the email, the phone number on the invoice you got because they could have just changed that as well. Um, but I think that gives you some protection. And then otherwise, if you're if an invoice comes in with new bank details, then making sure, again, you don't just go and change them without, again, re-verbal re approval. Because otherwise, if all you're doing is making payments to the same bank details you used previously, well, that is your, you've guaranteed, it worked once. So the worst thing that can happen is that bank account will close and get your money back. So yeah. I think that's a good process to, to have in place and not just relying on the data you receive via email, um, which is where I think e-invoicing eventually will hopefully help help in that, but we're not quite there yet from an uptake. Yeah, I, I strongly I strongly agree with you. Um, do not send the details via by email. Like I said, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not product, um, uh, you know, benefit here, but and actually, you know, keeping the TFN bank details, how we actually send that off to accounting practice, you know, using the likes of Amazon Key Management Service, um, it is, you know, completely encrypted. So these people cannot actually break into it and then, you know, arrive to you. Um, into the right spot without actually coming through that email. And as you said, often it's not the partners, it's the administration support staff that they're, um, they're, they're actually targeted as it comes through. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, distracted because I'm reading questions as they come in. So Rob, my friend Rob, good to see you here, mate. Um, I feel like I'm uh, going to dial a calling in. Uh, first time caller, long time listener. Uh, do you guys see risk moving forward that the banks will become less willing to engage with businesses who get stung in a scam? Anybody have a thought on that? Um, I would say no. Um, I think that the banks, you know, the, the banks obviously still want their business, right? They're not going to give it up. Um, if you are a potential flight risk, if you do come from a, um, you know, a country that may be, you know, somewhat a little bit um, considered as a risk, but I think that they are trying to go to all stops as well because they're losing money left, right and centre. Um, I think that it will be red flagged on your file that you may be a bit prone to it and might be suspicious activity. Um, and I think they will try and help you guide your way through. So I don't think it'll be a quick cutoff, um, but it certainly will actually draw some attention and work out what you're doing internally to make sure that you are secure. Um, and I know I get that from my banker as well, just making sure that, you know, you are, you are, did you request this and so forth. So um, scams aren't going to stop. They're getting much more sophisticated. We know that we've got AI. We know that, you know, originally we could pick up maybe someone's accent that looked like a scam. Now it's very much Australian if you're an Australia based, um, you know, and voice, you know, voiceovers can be <laughs> quickly replicated and it's, it's becoming more convincing. So I don't think the banks would actually cut you off, but I think that they're definitely red flagging and trying to stop it. And same with the government. Hmm. Uh, Soraya, what about you? How do you see? 
things like AI and tech being able to help improve or prevent more of this stuff in the future? You guys work on some pretty advanced stuff compared to most companies that I've seen. How do you guys think about it? Yeah, I guess it's like you're wanting to protect yourself from fraud um, when you can. And so you're wanting to be alerted to things that might potentially happen or like Brendan said, he can now investigate it because he has been alerted to the issue. In the past, without having these AI, you might not even notice that someone's gone through and changed the contact bank account details, um, those sorts of things. So yeah, just pro protecting yourself by having the right tools in place um, will then allow you to be able to investigate further. Cool. And Brendan, you talked to this before about the fact that this is likely to be a team member or someone else. How do you go about, like you go to it and you learn something, you hear something, what's your way of getting this information and dissecting it out to the rest of your team so that you're all on the same, the same, um, the, you've all educated at the same rate, you're keeping up to date with all, all the things. Yeah, look, I think it just depends on how you interact with your team, right? So whether yeah, your remote work or your office base or a combination. So like for our team, we have Slack. So we use that for regular updates to sort of share that across the team. We don't do bill approvals, obviously, through that, no, Trent. Um, we would never think of doing something silly like that. Um, but then otherwise, we have our regular sort of um, Zoom or team huddles type things sort of monthly to get everyone together from all the countries and different time zones um, to, to go through that stuff. And and what we've actually started to do is we realised with Slack, it actually gets quite busy. So you got a lot of things going on, people are dealing with different clients or projects. So you can overlook things. So what we've now tried to do is work out what our key messages were over the month and someone actually collates that and reshares that at our team meeting. And then someone will always go, oh, oh I missed that one. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, where we just took it for granted that everyone read every message and that's just not possible with the digital um, volume of messages we get these days. So um, that's been an extra way to sort of catch it up for us. Yeah, I sit in like eight different Slack accounts. Um, it is unlikely that I'm up to speed on all of it. So yeah, no, that's uh, that's tough. Um, so Ray, what about your side? You generally train one or two people at a time. How are you making sure... Or how do they make sure that everyone's up to speed on all of this? Yeah, I guess the benefit of expert is that you can put all your reoccurring workflow in there as well. So you can have your processes that are all the same um, across your whole practice. So no one's missing anything. Um, and at the same time as working through those tasks, you can see if there's any um, errors or anomalies within the file. So um, it's constantly being picked up. Everyone can see you're working with each other um, and you've got that generic process. Um, as well as the experts alerting you to, you know, any risk. And like I said before, kind of letting you know what that risk would be in the future if you don't go further and investigate it. Yeah, cool. Um, and there's heaps of questions coming through, which is great. Lots of comments, lots of people that have experienced certain things. We've seen a lot of people saying, yeah, I, you know, I live, get tolls, but I, I live in WA, so I never actually do anything with them or <laughs> whichever. Um People saying if you're giving money to fraudsters, the banks won't reimburse you because you gave permission for the transfer. Uh, lots of good things in here. There was a question here I thought might be interesting. See if anyone knows the answer. Um, Kathy, uh, or, or signed off as Kiwi Kathy. I appreciated that, Kathy. Uh, how do you compare the vulnerability of Australians who are getting scammed compared to those who are in New Zealand on the right side of the ditch, as Kiwi Kathy says? Anyone have a thought or an opinion? I don't know. That sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> no insight. Cool. Look, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, you do have a lot of um, international investors um, coming through New Zealand. Um, they do actually have a strong mandate for um, identification. So they're mandated every 12 months that you have to go through this process. Whilst it's only been introduced, well, it's, it has been around in Australia for a while now, but, you know, the Tax Practitioner Board and the ATO only mandated it this, this year. Um, I don't think it's been adopted or adapted um, very well, but I think that New Zealand does have stronger measures uh, in terms of, you know, identification theft and so forth. Um, and again, I'm probably more referring to the likes of finishing and so forth. Um, so I don't, I don't know the, the ratio where they're getting scammed more or not, but I think that they do have a stronger um, safeguard around them at the moment than what we do um, around the identification of a, of a personal. Yeah, I've noticed that in the UK as well, they're 
uh, that's coming up a lot more and more, that AML, KYC, yeah. anti-money laundering, know your yeah. customer checks and so forth. Um, a question here probably for Brendan or Soraya. So the question is, how do we? what's the best method to tell an organisation that we have actually updated our bank details and ABN? Like we have changed it. It's not a fraud. How do you do that without people thinking that's wrong? That's a fraud because the your you know your tech's not going to pick that up. Um, look, I'll jump in first. Look, hopefully, some people will still think it's a scam because if they've done that, then they're at least being cautious, which I guess is part of the message today of of, of not underreacting. So, um, so I think you're always under the risk that some people will go, "Hey, is that true?" But to me, that should be hopefully a, a quick phone because they should be phoning you. Quick phone call, yes, it's confirmed. Um, how do you try to reduce the risk of people um, overreacting? I, I think it's just a couple of channels of communication. So rather than just putting it on your invoice, um, it's probably also doing a separate mail out, letting them know that that's coming. Um, if you've got any other paraphernalia stuff that goes out to clients on a regular basis, letting them know. I wouldn't be going and advertising your bank details and your website or anything, but I think still to at least say, hey, yes, there has been a recent change. You would have got notified. Um, ring our office if you want to verbally confirm. And that's almost promoting good um, forward protection for, for your um, suppliers and customers as well. Um, yeah, otherwise, I guess the, the benefit of some of the accounting systems these days is that they do sort of, internal invoice as far as those links. So they don't actually give you a PDF, it's just a link to that um, invoice. So that helps a bit as well, where that's going to a, a zero or a QuickBooks web, web address, which is your invoice. It will have the correct bank details where the PDF would be, um, I guess, a higher risk of that being intercepted. Um, but I think the short answer is multiple forms of communication to give them more confidence that it is actually a legitimate change. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Anyone have anything to add on top of that? Um, I guess with expert linking in with the ABR, we're going to always ensure that your details are up to date um, with the ABR and, and making sure that your ABN details are correct. We're also going to look over any attachments that you have to make sure that, you know, that ABNs are correct on there. So if you are flagged with something like that and you haven't been told by the client um, and they've given you, you know, a new ABN or anything like that, you can triple check it through there as well. That's pretty cool. Good. Yeah. Hmm, very good. Hey, uh, we're coming into our probably last 10 minutes or so. Um, so anyone that's listening, uh, again, questions, the chat. Hey, you guys are on fire with the chat today. Keep it coming. Um, so that was good. Just had one from uh, Nisha. I hope I pronounced that properly. Can you believe that a scammer lodged an activity statement on behalf of a client and they got a huge refund from it? It's an interesting piece there around Baz Lodgements, how we're lodging tax. Um, I was going to throw it to M Reader, but I'll just throw it to, if anyone else has an opinion as well, please do. But how do we see our regulatory bodies, our banks, our governments, how do we see them stepping into help with some of this stuff? Because we, we saw some big blowouts with Medibank, we Optus, uh, even Service New South Wales um, has experienced a little bit of this uh, this year as well. How do, how, what should we expect or what should we be asking them to uh, to help do for us? Well, I'll jump in then. Um, I think to M Reader's point before she touched on it, we've got to stop it at the at the at the first gate, right? And the first gate is before it even gets to the consumer or the individual. So to me, at some point, like I would expect the government's going to put extra responsibility on the likes of Telstra, Optus and the internet providers to actually stop these spam emails, phone calls and text messages from even getting to the other side. I had seen some media that Optus had stopped so many text messages or Telstra, one of the two, um, but we all know we're still getting lots of them. So that's at least they're stopping some, but with all the technologies that, are, that is available, they, at some point they're going to be asked to do more. Yeah, I think, I think so too, and I think they really should. Um, like I said, you know, I've actually just reverse engineered how quickly it is to hijack someone's phone number just for the security purposes of our company, um, and it's such a simple process um, to be able to do that, and it, it's it's so scary, it's alarming. Um, one of the things that we do um, for our clients with Anitra, um, because we don't advertise Anitra in the, you know, in the email or the text message, we want it to be branded, you know, the, the 
you know, our clients, so whether it's your business, Brendan, or whatever it may be, but um, the text message is coming from your dedicated text number um, with your logo, your details. The email is always branded you. So this gives the client an understanding. But if it's coming from manager, they probably don't understand who we are. But certainly when it comes from your firm, this is another step measure to put in place. So we really, um, you know, try and take those uh, new clients down that journey. Um, on this path. One of our biggest clients is McDonald's and McDonald's use us for HR purposes because they have a lot of uh, juniors that are coming through and need a par uh, parental consent for them to actually start their employment. So again, coming from McDonald's, they actually know who they're talking to. They've got a, you know, a child that's just starting work. And so they can actually, you know, obviously um, provide a lot of detail there to a complete stranger. So um, the government does have to step up, but again, it's just those simple measures as to who the recipient is, where it's coming from, is it a trusted source? And as you said before, Brendan, educating your clients, we would never send this to you. And you know, the banks always say that to you too. We would never send you this. We would never ask you that. The ATA would never ring you for this or this or that. So I think, you know, it is getting stronger, but it's just, you know, we have to keep reiterating this to our clients as to what we would and wouldn't do and what to expect and what not to expect um, from us that goes through. Mm. Soraya, any other final points or comments on this part? Not on that one. Cool. So just to recap as we head into the end of this, you can all see my screen again now. Is that right? Should be yep. how to protect yourself from scams. Fab. Um, so there was three things. We said stop, think, protect. I think the other thing that we've talked um, a little bit about in this session has been your process, your systems. Like what are you using to help uh, make this easy for you? Because example, if you're collecting driver's license and details and things in your inbox, that's a risk. If you're having to do those KYC AML um, checks, don't do that. Use a system. There's plenty of good systems out there. Example, um, Em Reader and the team at Anitra are here today. That's exactly what they do if you, you're looking for that sort of stuff. Um, don't manually approve bills in inboxes or text messages or Slack channels you've got tools like Approval Max um, that help you put those stop gaps in place. Uh, and then lastly, if you're just needing, again, it's hard to be across lots of clients. So having your systems checked automatically by um, the system like Expert, the AI system, then your one less thing that you're needing to do and you're getting alerted when something might happen, not if. Um, so you're not just checking everything for the sake of it, you're getting it flagged to you once you know there is something to actually uh, check out. Now, if anyone's got another question or uh, anything in the chat, you can put that in here. You're welcome to ask our panel absolutely everything except what they're having for dinner tonight. One thing that I should touch on too that comes up all the time is where is your data stored? Mm. Uh, it is the one of the most common questions that we get asked. Um, I, I know it's not um, probably raised in the questions um, on the with the group today, but just to irradiate that, um, you know, obviously we did have a lot of companies that are offshore that were providing services to Australia and New Zealand and so forth. Um, it is important that we actually have our data here. Um, for the likes of Anitra, you know, we use Amazon um, Web Services. Uh, our data is replicated over three, um, three zones within Australia. So if one goes down or potentially there's a disaster, environmental disaster, the others will kick in. But also to that, they include regular security um, updates, automatically, um, you know, sorry, audits, audits, and automatically security updates. So for those that do actually question, like where's the data stored, we store it within each region. So even though we are a global company, each one has its own data house and it's not, um, it's replicated maybe over three different locations. So if one's down, the other one comes up. So maybe not so important to the end consumer, but it is your data um, if, as accountants and so forth. Um, I would be asking that question. It's a really valid one. Where is it? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Love it. Um, no other questions coming through. So what we're going to do to end, I'm actually just going to ask all of you one question. Just tell us one sentence about the, the the businesses you represent that are trying to help solve this problem. I kind of did this before just as a, as a wrap, but um, yeah, if you just want to go through and Brendan, you're at the top of my screen. So I'll start with you. Just talk us through what's that, what's that one thing that um, you think Approval Max is doing in this space to help protect everyone? Thanks, Trent. Um, Look, for me, appro Approval Max just makes the ability to take con keep control of your expenditure um, and empower that across your team so it's not one person responsible. Um, so we love it across our client base. We can see what's happening. 
And then if there are any other issues regarding who approved what or why did we pay this, there's a good audit trail which goes straight in your accounting system. So I think the takeaway, all that paper, all that risk of email and Slack messages, um, something like approval max is really, uh, it just streamlines the hell of it and puts a lot better safeguards than what you could ever do um, as an as your own sort of makeshift system. So, Yeah, awesome. It's purpose built, right? Like it's, it's built specifically for that, that reason. Um, why would you do anything else? Uh, and Rita. Yeah, um, so ours is pretty simple. Obviously, we are interacting with a lot of um, clients that need to sign, whether it's contracts, uh, whether it's agreeing rents, whether it's engagement letters and so forth, and ensuring that, in particular, because you know, since COVID kicked in, that the person that is signing, that we actually understand it is the right person um, that is signing and that we have a complete audit trail on that. Um, and a further step from there, if you need even more um, confirmation, then using the likes of biometrics with identification process, um, this ensures that this uh, accounting practice or legal firm, whoever they're dealing with, knows that they're actually dealing with a legit person. Um, and that's that's our whole job is based on security to make sure the right document is going to the right person and that we are actually speaking to that person um, per se. Yeah, awesome. Very good. And Soraya? Um, I guess we work with quite a lot of different um, you know, accountants, bookkeepers, individual businesses, um, especially with the accountants and bookkeepers, like it's your responsibility to look after your clients' financial data um, and experts constantly running over the file to ensure that you're alerted um, of the potential fraud that could be happening or even just, um, you know, daily bookkeeping tasks that you might need to monitor, unusual monthly um, billing and all of that sort of things. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you're all protected long term, so you're not enduring the kind of financial and emotional impacts that fraud can have. Yeah, awesome, very good, love it. Well, we're coming to the end of the session. There isn't too many questions coming through, but what I wanted to do is just give you uh, an opportunity to um, let us know if you need any more information on this and you'd like to hear from any of the speakers. So um, in this little poll that's coming up on your screen. It just basically says, are you interested in learning more about either Approval Max, Anature, and or Expert? You can tick multiple, you can tick none of them. It's completely up to you. Um, all you need to do is uh, tick on the box and you'll, you'll get an email at some point, um, probably tomorrow or, or so, just saying, hey, thanks for coming to the session. Here's a bit more information. Um, I know all of them offer, um, uh, I was going to say trials, and then I realized I'm not across everyone's trial process you can speak to those team members about looking at that product and there may or may not be a trial available for you to check out um, depending on which one you want to look at. But um, thank you everyone for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed the session. Uh, feel free to put that in the feedback in the chat. You can tell us if this was good, great, or if you, and we're open, you can tell me if you didn't like it. I'd love to know more. Um, but yeah, if you have any feedback, let us know. We'd love to learn from this. And if you'd like to see us tackle another topic what would that be if it's along these lines? What could we dive into further that would help you uh, on your, your path of running your business for uh, you or your clients? Everyone, any final comments, closing? You're welcome to sign off any which way you please. Brendan, M, or Soraya, anything you'd All like right. to add? I'd just like to say thank you very much for everyone taking the time out today. Um, it's good to catch up with everybody and um, to go through these uh, security measures. Absolutely. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Trent. Thanks, everyone, for attending today. Awesome. And thank you, Soraya. Thanks. Thanks for running. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Uh, there will be a copy recording of this session, so uh, you will be able to get access to that very soon. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time. Okay. Take care. Bye.